Harry's Wife, part 91.15, In Your Face, Video Analysis. Hello and welcome back. I'm H.G. Tudor, and I'm taking you through a video analysis of an interview that takes place between Reuben J. and Harry's wife in relation to Season 5 of Suits, which provides us with a very good opportunity to understand more about the narcissistic dynamic and the behaviours of Harry's wife. Let's go straight back to the interview. Now, in season one, when Mike got hired, you had no interest in him, or at least played it off. At right. what point do you think throughout the four seasons did Megan, or did, uh, did Rachel start <laughs> getting them on the computer? Megan was like, you know what, Mike, this fictitious character, there's something here. Hey, there's but no, Rachel, meanwhile... Rachel, uh, when did Rachel, like, fall for him? I think she probably, you know, the middle of season one as we're watching that courtship develop. She probably just found him so refreshing because she was so accustomed to these men that were had this bravado and this posturing, more of the Logan Sander types, right? Like the guys that come in with all this ego, and Mike is the opposite of that. So even though his, you know, confidence has developed over the past few seasons, certainly it's a very different, um, different approach at the onset. Pausing at two minutes and eight seconds, Reuben J asks a question in relation to season one and Mike getting hired. And in her answer, you will notice that Harry's wife places her hand upon his shoulder. Again, assertion of control through physical contact, lack of boundary recognition, sense of entitlement. As far as I'm aware, she doesn't know Mr. J particularly well, and therefore this is intrusive behaviours. But she thinks, driven by her narcissism, that she's just being plainful and playful and interesting. Where, of course, she's being intrusive. She continues, of course, to stand very close to Mr. J. He then asks a question about Rachel falling for Mike or such like, and in her answer we see again the customary hand-waving that Harry's wife engages in. Whirring of the right hand, the two hands come up back and forth, karate chopping the air right in front of Mr. J's face. Again, sense of entitlement, absence of boundary recognition. And then as she's giving her explanation with regard to the dynamic between certain characters in the show... Mr. J then makes the mistake, or at least in the world of Harry's wife, makes the mistake of looking down at his cue cards. And he's obviously looking for what's he going to ask her next. Perhaps he's not particularly well prepped for this interview. He does appear a little bit nervous, but he's looking ahead as to what he's going to ask now. Notice that immediately as he does so, therefore he's not giving his attention to Harry's wife, that wounds her. The simple act of him looking away for more than a moment and staring at his own information, affects wounding. Her fury will start to ignite. Of course, because she's in a public pace, the facade management that is required keeps that fury from bursting forth in terms of her headbutting Mr. J and grabbing his nuts and giving them a squeeze. Instead, it causes her eyes to look at what he's doing, and you will notice there's a couple of clenches of the jaw as the narcissism fights utilising the facade management to keep the ignited fury under control. It's demonstrative of the fact that looking away for a prolonged period of time, even though it's just a few seconds, more than just glancing to the left and then going back to her as interviewing, the fact that he looks down at his cue cards results in there being wounding affected upon her. He's no longer giving her fuel and he's not interacting with her. That is a threat to control. For many of you, you wouldn't particularly be bothered. You'd think, yes, he's just looking ahead, that's okay. He's stood in front of me, he'll interview me, he'll continue the interview, he'll continue talking to me, he'll look back up at me in a moment. But when it comes to the narcissist, even a few seconds of looking away is signaling to the narcissist that they're not important. And that sensation of vulnerability starts to rise. And with a less evolved narcissist that is Harry's wife, that fury immediately ignited, starts to try and get to the surface. And we see that with the change of facial expression and the clenching of the jaw. I can't remember what else I was going to ask you. I'm not even, you don't even have a card I have, for me. I have a card for you. It's probably the blank no, one. you don't. Yes, I do. Let, there it is. Oh, there, okay, there it is. Who okay. did it? Okay, so, okay. Who did Rachel? Okay, so playing did, Rachel. Why did What's Rachel it like fall playing Rachel? It's great. Like, like, 
Rachel's obviously, like, for me, I think, you know, you're probably one of the prettiest women on television. That's kind of um, you. And I totally fangirled when I saw you right now. And I'm like, it's so exciting. <laughs> so, obviously, I want to know what it's like for you to be playing you know, Rachel Zane, who, you know, the backstory is, you know, daughter of a, of a lawyer. Yes. Working in a law firm. Right. Wanting to make her own way. Falls in love with this guy who ends up being a criminal. Pausing at 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Mr. J confesses that he forgot what else he was going to ask Harry's wife. This, of course, is challenge fuel. He's still talking to her and providing an emotional response, which gives her fuel, but his confession that he forgot what he was going to ask her suggests that she's not that important and doesn't merit proper preparation. And therefore, that means that that threat has to be nullified. And she, Harry's wife does so, first of all, by looking at the card and then her provocative put-down stating, you don't even have a card for me. Reuben J counters that by saying, yes, I do. Then Harry's wife, as a further assertion of control, because she doesn't believe him, takes his own cards from him which is asset appropriation, lack of boundary recognition, sense of entitlement. She affirms, no, you don't. Again, provocative comment, as she continues to put him down for the purpose of the assertion of control. He explains that he does, and she starts reading the cards. So she's taken his cards away from him. She starts reading them as if they belong to her, exhibiting her sense of entitlement. And she then comments, oh, there I am. And because it's clear that she is on the cards, that allows the narcissism to regain that sense of control. She, however, showing her absence of boundary recognition, decides that she's going to be both interviewer and interviewee. Sense of entitlement. As she starts to read the question out, Reuben J valiantly attempts to recover his position by asking the question himself. She then looks at him intently, and he pays a compliment by saying, you're one of the prettiest women on television. Harry's wife responds with, that's kind, thank you. Note her tone, patronising and condescending. And of course, what's really going on in her mind is, you better believe it, Sonny Jim. And she doesn't really regard it as a compliment, but that merely that that should be acknowledged as a matter of fact. She then bursts into one of the incongruous giggles that we've witnessed many times before. And again, notice her expression, how it suddenly drops. It alternates between the smile suddenly appearing and then dropping, the giggle coming out of nowhere, which is relatively incongruous to what's going on around her, and then the expression thereafter drops. So we see the wrestling for control that goes on in that situation, the lack of boundary recognition, the sense of entitlement and lack of accountability for her behaviour. Remember, her narcissism isn't saying, this fellow is affecting your control, you need to take his cards from him, start reading them, and then speak to him in a condescending tone when he compliments you. No. It all happens instinctively. Her narcissism drives her to just take them, and she doesn't see that there's anything wrong with it. In fact, she probably believes that she's being friendly and playful. But to an objective observer, and of course one that's in the know about her narcissism, it's anything but. What's it like playing Rachel? I love it. I mean, like, I find her so... Look, there are times when I don't love it because... No, 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 no. We're going to get to that in a second. There are times that I don't love it because she cries more than anyone in the entire world. Yeah. And I am not personally that... I'm not sensitive in that same way, so I have to empathize with the fact that she does take things on. Granted, her life is a lot more complicated than most people's, and there's a lot of added pressure. I love playing her, though, because I really see her as a role model for young women, and I take seriously the choices she makes and the fact that she really values her career as well as her relationship and finding that balance. So for me, it's a lot of fun, plus I can borrow from her amazing closet, which, as a girl, I'm really pleased to be able to do. Pausing at 3 minutes and 27 seconds. Ruben J asks, what's it like playing Rachel? And we get an absolutely brilliant example of the compartmentalization of the narcissism in action. First of all, we get a shrug. Then she says, I love it. Then we're told, look, there are times where I don't love it. So which one is it? Is Which one is it? You don't know. You do love it. Actually, you don't love it. 
All of that said, and all of that is said and done in the space of a few seconds, and that shows the compartmentalization that the narcissism goes through. In the first instance, it decides that she's going to shrug. I don't know. Then, actually, I love it. No, now it's I don't love it, and that shows how the narcissism operates in those splinters of a moment. The first moment, it's I don't know. The next moment, it's I love it. The next moment, it's there are times where I don't love it. And those sections are not connected. And therefore, that's why she gives three responses which effect contradict one another. And it's an excellent example of the compartmentalization. Thereafter, Reuben J attempts to get his cards back. And the response to that, of course, it's a threat to control. He's trying to take the cards back. Even though they are his cards... In the world of Harry's wife, they now belong to her. Asset appropriation, assertion of control. And she smacks that down with, no, 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 we'll get to that in a second. What does that put you in the mind of? Yes, a mother chastising a child. It's condescending in the way that she treats him. And it's a bit like, mummy's taken your toys away because you've been a naughty boy and you'll get them back as and when I decide. They are the property of Reuben J, a grown man, but she treats him like a little boy, chastising him, patronising him. Can you imagine what Prince Harry goes through on a regular basis? That's just giving you a little glimpse of the treatment that he'll be receiving. She then embarks upon explaining more about the character and explains that she cries way more than she does and I'm not sensitive in that way. Oh, right. Okay, well, thanks for that insight. So you're not sensitive in the sense of claiming that you've got suicidal ideation or that people have got it in for you as you bleated in your Africa interview or the various pity plays that you doled out in the Oprah Winfrey interview. She, of course, in that moment, regards the character's tears and uh, crying, etc., as weak. So she distances herself from that. And, in so doing, has to state that she's not that sensitive. Of course, on other occasions, she will be sensitive. Because on those other occasions, it suits her narcissism to play the sensitive card. Again, demonstrating the hypocritical nature of her behaviours. Harry's wife then goes on to explain that she loves playing Rachel Zane, as she sees her as a role model for young women. Facade management, assertion of control... What, wandering around in your skimpies and getting off with various members of the of the cast as a, in character? That's a good role model, is it, for women? Well, if you say so. And then she goes on to explain, and also I get to borrow from her closet, which as a girl I'm really pleased to be able to do. Notice again the compartmentalisation. I am a strong, independent woman who is a role model for girls everywhere. Ooh, I love clothing. Isn't it great to be able to borrow all the clothes? In that instant flicking from one to the other, and she doesn't see the incongruity or the hypocrisy of what she's just said because the narcissism doesn't let her. She talks about being a role model, notwithstanding some of the things that her character does in the play, uh, in the in the um, television programme rather, would not be seen as something that would be a role model for young girls. And then in the next breath, she goes into the stereotype of, well, all women are interested in his clothes and shoes. And plays up to that. This again demonstrates the status of her as a mid-range narcissist. That her narcissism doesn't allow her to think ahead. Doesn't connect what's said in this moment to that moment. And that just underpins it magnificently. We will continue with more observations and revelations in part 91.16. Join me there. <laughs>